Well, good morning, Forward Church. It is so good to be here with you, whether you're joining us here in person at Cambridge or at our Kitchener site, or whether you're joining us online, we just wanna say welcome, and uh, isn't it good to be together as God's church? Um, we get to lift our voices and worship together this morning, and I know we're really excited because we've stepped into step three, and it allows us uh, some new freedoms and some new opportunities, and uh, certainly for us as a church, that, that gives us uh, some, some more capacity and allows us to meet like this on a Sunday morning. Um, but we got a new song this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing this song. Um, and this song talks about a day that is coming. And as excited as we are to see step one, step two, step three, we keep looking forward to these new things that are available to us. As Christ followers, we have an amazing future to look forward to. Because there will be a day where we get to stand with our Savior and we get to spend eternity with him. So no matter what we're looking at today and no matter what step we might be in, we can look to the future with hope because we have our hope in our Savior. And so as the song might be new to you, as uh, you might be um, looking at the words, maybe you just want to take them in and soak them in this morning. Um, but when you feel ready to join us, lift up your voice and sing the hymn of heaven with us this morning. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears and then One voice, a thousand generations Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain And on that day, we join the resurrection And stand beside the heroes of the faith And with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain Yeah. 
shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We praise a mighty roar, glory to our God, who gave his life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yo! 
recognize you as our living hope. The one that we can look forward to spending eternity with. The one that carries us through every season of life because you have proven to be faithful and good. And God, as we think upon your goodness and your faithfulness, your love for us, the way that we can always set our eyes on you and know that you will carry us forward. Lord, the song that comes out of us is a song of praise and worship. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long because of what you have done, Jesus. This is my song. 
God, we come here together to worship you, to meet you here. We ask that your spirit be present, not only in this place, bringing a spirit of knowledge and wisdom, but God, that your spirit would be working in each and every one of our hearts as we're connecting together all these weeks, this whole Sermon on the Mount, God, bringing it together for this final message today. I pray that as you speak through Pastor Derek, as you speak this morning, that you would open our hearts, remind us of the challenge that you give to us, of the next step that we need to continue to take to be your disciples and followers for those of us who say this is our story. God, for those who are here who are struggling, who have questions, who things don't just seem quite right, and they're coming here, God, to seek you out, to see if you're real, to see if you're worth it. God, I pray your spirit on them today that they would sense your spirit is there and has always been there and that you are beckoning to them to come back into relationship with you. God, that as much as we as Christians sometimes mess it up, you are a God who is loving and just and perfect. You don't disappoint. It's you that we can put our hope in. And so I pray that you would meet those people here today. For people who are struggling in their own storms right now, health diagnoses, working through treatments, struggling with things that are unknown, struggling with things that are known, but just are a huge burden. God, we know that you meet us in each and every one of those storms, that we are not alone, that you care for us, that you hold us, God, but I know in my own life, I, I praise you for some of those storms. I praise you for those storms because that's when I've really sensed how close to me you are, how broken this world really is and how much we really need you. And so I pray that your spirit would speak peace and hope into those people who are struggling, whose hearts are hurting, that they would find their hope in you, that they would cling to you in the midst of those storms. And God, we wanna lift up our global outreach family. We wanna lift up Dave and Martina Brubaker and the boys as they've headed back to Ulan Uday just to wrap up and say goodbyes that's made more difficult through COVID lockdowns, that as they figure out how to pack up 10 years of their lives to figure out what to take and what to leave and how to use what they have to continue to honor you, God. There's so many decisions and so many things that are just heart issues as, as they continue to follow your leading to oversee the larger ministry, to continue to build into those local leaders, um, that God, they love you and they love the people that you would let them to and they want to finish this well. So we pray that you would honor that prayer, that you would help them to be able to wrap up well and to move with wisdom. God, we lift this morning up to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and have a seat. everyone, Josh here. It's great to be able to gather with you in person and online. If you're new here, we're so glad you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us. If you're already a part of the Forward family, it's good to see you too. Each week, we come together through our services, events, and ministries to love God, love others, and serve the world. Let's see what's happening this week at Forward. Hey Forward, we're reaching the end of our new normal series, but we don't want it to just end there. Through the One Degree Shift, we want to give you an opportunity to keep growing as a disciple of Jesus so you can better love God, love others, and serve the world every day. So check out our One Degree Shift page on forwardchurch.ca or scan the QR code below for resources and prompts to help you grow as a disciple of Jesus. If you're a follower of Christ and haven't been baptized yet, a great next step is baptism. 
We're holding our next baptism service on Sunday, August the 8th to help further your walk with God. Baptism is a public declaration of our faith in Jesus, and we want to celebrate it with you. All you have to do is scan the QR code below or text BAPTISM to connect with us on how you can be part of our next baptism service. And that's what's happening this week. You can find all of our announcements and events on our website at forwardchurch.ca. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on Facebook or Instagram. Now let's prepare our hearts for today's message. Have a great morning. your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. As Amanda already mentioned, we are at our very last week in the Sermon on the Mount in our New Normal series. As you turn there, I feel like I get to do this every time I come up now. This is great. It's my pleasure to announce the marriage between Zachary Brennan of Waterloo, Ontario and Naomi Fiji of Air, Ontario. The wedding is to take place, Lord willing, this coming Saturday, July 24th in Kitchener, Ontario. And Zachary and Naomi, uh, we just want to let you know we're celebrating with you. We are praying the Lord's blessing upon you on your wedding day and on all the days, months, and years to follow. Today, we are going to end a journey that started, if you can believe this, just after Easter. We've actually now been in the Sermon on the Mount for 15 weeks. And when we first started into this and somebody found out that this was going to be a 15-week series, I had that person say to me, so let me get this straight. You're going to spend 15 sermons doing what Jesus did in one. And I said, uh, yep, you got me and not Jesus. So unfortunately, and you can ask my wife Amanda. She will tell you I am very good at taking things that should take a lot shorter period of time and making them last a lot longer, like folding laundry. I'm just a pro at that. So as we've been going through this, like I hope your experience has been like mine, though, which is not that, wow, I can't believe we've dragged through 15 weeks. Couldn't they like, uh, have shortened this up? But that you've been sitting there saying, wow, this is so rich and so deep and so relevant and so radical that we could have spent way more time here. Like when we went through uh, the Beatitudes at the beginning, I thought, oh, I, I scheduled one week for this. I should have scheduled like seven weeks for this. And if you haven't, uh, let me just put this out there right now. That's on me. That's not on Jesus. Because <laughs> as we're going to see, when people heard Jesus speak this message, man, they were amazed. It says right at the end of his sermon, everyone who heard these words, that they were astonished at this teaching because he spoke as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And so let's Read the end of this passage of, of Scripture. Read the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and then I'm going to unpack it for us and hopefully try and draw all of what we've been walking through these last 14 weeks together in week 15. It says, starting in verse 24, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, they will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and it beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these minds, words of mine and does not do them, they'll be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell, and the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell in great was the fall of it. And Jesus uses at the end of his sermon a parable, a story, a word picture to help bring everything that he has taught to this point together. He says there's two guys, there's two people, there's two individuals, and they share a couple things in common. First of all, they're both builders. They're both building houses. And second, these houses that they built, they both faced storms and floods and wind. And the first thing I want us to see this morning is that we're all builders. 
Every single one of us in this room is a builder because to live is to build. In fact, you can go and you can Google build a life and you will find all sorts of articles devoted to the topic of how do you go about building a life? The first article I came upon was simply that, how to build a life. Then if you continue down, eight ways to build a life you love. 20 things that you should do right now to build a life that feels good. And I read that one because I was really hopeful that in there would be take a nap. I was having one of those days. It was not in there. There was no, no take a nap. But the routines of life, I think, can, can, can cause us to forget or to not realize that what we're doing every day, every decision, in every relationship, with every habit, Every action we take is an action that is building a life. We're building. And, and through his whole sermon, this has been Jesus' challenge to us, is, is to consider the type of life that we're building. How are we building? What are we living for? Are, are, you, are you living as salt and light, right? Are, are you living a life that that shines light onto the beauty and majesty of God. That's light. Are, are you living as salt where you're, you're acting as something that adds flavor and acts as a preservative in this world, in the decay and rot of this world? He, he gets into sin and he unpacks a deeper understanding of sin that goes beyond just the external to the internal. And, and, and we're challenged that whether we're we're just going through the motions and are we letting sin slide in our life or are we taking drastic action to curtail it and to deal with it? And he asks us questions to consider like, like who are we living to please? What audience are we living for? What master are we serving? What drives us? What's our motivations? Where do we find our meaning and our security and our comfort? And all of these things are, are causing us to try and break out of the routines of just going through the routines of life and recognize you're building something. You are a builder. What type of life are you and I building? Are you investing all of your energy into a temporary living situation? Are you taking everything you have? Think about this. When you live for this world and this life, it is the equivalent of taking your life's investments and in work and investing them in a hotel room that you're spending a couple nights in at the expense of the house that you're gonna move into for the rest of your life, right? And so, so Jesus has been challenging us to think on this because that's foolish and, and that's stupid. And, and he's lovingly calling us to stop. So as the... The hymn says, and I referenced this a few weeks back, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. Right? That's, that's the truth of building. So if you are building on anything other than Jesus, let me just call out to you today and say, hey, consider what you're building. Consider what you're building. But here, you know what? Jesus is actually talking to two builders who aren't building radically different things. In fact, these two individuals are building houses that look incredibly similar. They're, they're, they're building houses that if you and I were walking down the street, we would think, well, that's, that house is the same as the other house. It must have been built by the same builder. And So think about it this way. Think about these two individuals as two individuals who who both go to church, who both read and know their Bibles. They, they come on Sunday and they sing the same worship songs. They get into a life group and, or a class and, and they discuss the teachings of Jesus. And, and you might look from the outside and say, they look really, really similar. These seem to be the same type of houses. And so you have... Two builders building similar houses and then you have the same reality for both of them that they both face storms. And I just think it's so important that we acknowledge this fact. We all face storms. We all face storms. It doesn't matter who you are. Whether you're 
Buddhist or Muslim or Sikh or Hindu or, Jew, or you're a Jew or an atheist. You're uh, spiritual but not religious. You're religious but not spiritual. You might have memorized the entire book of Psalms. You might still think that when you read Psalms that you actually pronounce it Psalm. It doesn't matter who you are, you're going to face storms in your life. It doesn't matter how moral you are. It doesn't matter how kind you are, how rich you are, what country you come from. Sooner or later, the storms of life are going to come along and hit the life that you've been building, and they're going to batter them with rains and with floods and with wind. So you're going to get sick. Someone around you that you know and love, they're going to get sick. You're going to experience disappointment. You're going to experience betrayal. You're going to experience heartache and heartbreak. You may lose your job. You may lose your spouse. You may lose a child or your marriage. The reality of the storms of life is that we all get beat up. We all get ripped down. We all get knocked sideways and knocked over. We don't all necessarily face the same storms. We don't all necessarily face the same severity of storms. Sometimes the storms come in different seasons for us, but the storms of life come. We all face storms. Look at verse 25 and verse 27. It's the exact same wording, right? Both builders faced the exact same things. The rains fall and the floods come and the winds blow and they beat for both houses. If you think following Jesus is, is a way to avoid the storms of life, you aren't listening to Jesus. You know, one of the last things Jesus said when he was in that upper room with his disciples before he went to the cross, he said, in this world you will have trouble. But he didn't leave it there. He said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. See, it's not that as Christians we won't experience suffering in this world. It's that we live in an expectation of a world where suffering will be no more. That's the difference. The difference is not what we encounter in this world. It's the world that we look forward to after this world that changes everything. And so if you're in a storm right now, here's what I need you to hear this morning. It's not because God doesn't love you. It doesn't necessarily mean that God's bringing his judgment on you. Storms come in life, and yes, Yes, I I think that storms give us an opportunity to reflect and take some time and say, hey, have I put myself in the way of the storm? Because that happens, right? And some of us have decided to build houses and put them right smack dab in front of where hurricanes flow through. And so yes, we can put ourselves in positions where we're going to be more likely to hit storms, but storms come. And it it is not the way that we judge whether Jesus loves us or not. We live in a broken world that is infected by sin. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans that all creation groans right now in this fallen world. This is the reality. It's broken. And until the day when Jesus returns, we're going to continue to live lives that get ravaged by storms. But listen, one day Jesus is going to return. And just like there was a day where his disciples were in the middle of the storm in the Sea of Galilee, and he stepped out onto the boat, and he spoke, and everything was calm, there's going to be a day where Jesus returns. And he speaks, and all the storms of life cease. For all time. The storm and the presence of the storm is not the indicator in this story of who is really a follower of Jesus and who isn't. That's not the indicator. Look, there's two similar houses facing the same storm, but only one is left standing. What is it that allowed one house to stand firm in the middle of the storms while the other collapsed? 
The difference, Jesus says, is the foundation upon which the builders built. See, the foundation we build on determines whether we will withstand the storms of life. Let's read this section one more time. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house. But it did not fall. Why? Because it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, well, they'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against the house. And because it was built on the wrong foundation, it fell. Two individuals, both building houses, both facing storms. But those two houses have two different foundations upon which they are built. One man built his house on the rock. Now here's where we immediately go for many of us when when we've grown up in church. We immediately think, ah, he's talking about Jesus. But the rock here is not Jesus. Now, I know that's hard because many of us, we grew up singing, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And so we, we think about sand and rock and we hear this and we immediately look past Jesus' actual words and think, oh, he's talking about himself. And that's a great confession. I'm, I'm not dogging on that confession. Those words are absolutely, positively true. Salvation is found in Jesus alone. It's not Jesus plus anything else. You are not saved by Jesus plus baptism, by Jesus plus church attendance, by Jesus plus communion, by Jesus plus being a nice person, by Jesus plus doing good things. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul makes it clear. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of our works. So you and I, we don't get to boast about anything. Because Jesus plus anything ruins everything. Like, you hear that clearly, because I need you to hold on to that when we go into this, because some of you are going to start adding things to Jesus, and that's not the point. It's that Jesus should, knowing Jesus as the rock, should do some things in us. Listen to what Jesus says is the rock that the builder built on. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. If you're gonna be the wise person who builds the house on the rock, you are a person who hears and does God's word. If we truly believe in Jesus, if we believe in him, like faith in him, it always results in obeying Jesus. Let me be clear. Faith alone in Christ alone justifies But the faith that justifies is never alone. Saving faith is a working faith. Saving faith always makes itself known through obedience. Obedience is the fruit, it's the result to show that our faith in Christ is real. And if there is no obedience, we gotta question whether we have truly come to put our faith in Jesus. The wise man builds a life on the foundation of obedience, on the habit of obedience, of walking day by day, step by step, putting Jesus' words into action. In contrast to the wise man is the man who hears and doesn't do anything with the words that he hears. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them, be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. You may go to church regularly. You may read your Bible daily. You may really, really, really think Jesus is a great guy. That's not a good enough foundation. I'm not trying to diminish the importance of hearing. You can't do until you hear. 
So hearing is incredibly important. Jesus says we need to hear. But hearing is not the ending point. Showing up to church on Sunday, that's the catalyst. It's, it's not the conclusion. Man, occasionally, I hear from people who tell me that they enjoy my preaching, which is always, it's nice to hear. I've heard from lots of people who tell me otherwise. That's okay, too. Sometimes I'll, I'll even hear that I've helped somebody better understand God's word. And that's great. I think that's awesome. But the teachings of Jesus are not meant to be enjoyed or understood or admired. The teachings of Jesus are meant to be applied. Hear me on this. So let's, let's see what Jesus is actually talking about here. Because I I brought some stuff along. So Jesus says, hey, we, we can build a couple houses here. And, and if you can't see what's under the houses, they look the same. And the same reality comes on those houses, Right? The storms of life come and people get sick and lose jobs and their finances crash. But if you're on the rock, it doesn't move it. But if you've only heard Jesus' words and not put them into application, if you've been a hearer and not a doer, the same storm comes and it pours on you and it rains And the foundation, man, people might not even see it on the outside, but it starts to crumble beneath you until it falls. And one house is left standing, and one house has tumbled. That's the picture that Jesus is putting out for us. The only way that you can keep standing when the storms of life come is to not only just hear Jesus' words, but to do them, to be obedient, to develop a pattern and a lifestyle of obedience in your life. And listen, it doesn't mean that when the storm comes, the house might not creak. It doesn't mean that When the storm comes, you might not sit there and start to wonder and doubt the structural integrity of what you've built. It means that you'll make it through. If you haven't moved from simply hearing the words of Jesus, admiring the words of Jesus, understanding the words of Jesus, to applying the words of Jesus... If you haven't developed a pattern of obedience in your life, when the storms of life hit, and they will, no matter how similar your house look to the other house, and you look like a good Christian on Sunday mornings, and you showed up to life group and other people thought it was great, when the storms of life come, they will end up revealing the reality of the foundation upon which you've built, it will collapse and it will be catastrophic, not just to you, but to anybody around the house, anybody else in the house, in the vicinity of it. So listen, as we finish this Sermon on the Mount, let's do some real reflecting on what we've been building on. Are we the type of builder who is building on a firm foundation? Are we the type of builder who is building on sand? Like, as we've traveled now for 15 weeks, has anything in your life changed? Have you done anything with anything that you've heard or studied in life group? Or if you look, would you say, man, I'm basically in the same spot I was. Like, it's been three and a half months. Have you deepened in your sense of spiritual bankruptcy? 
Has your awareness for God's grace gone up? If so, like, here's how that would reflect itself. It would probably reflect itself in enhanced prayer life. Because when you realize how desperately in need of God's grace you are, guess what? You get on your knees. It, it reveals itself in, in a greater love and empathy towards others because you don't see yourself in, in a position of, I'm over them, I've achieved, but you see yourself on equal level at the cross with others. Do you have an increased discomfort with sin? Like, it, it is, when you see sin in your life, is it bothering you more? Do you have a, a growing desire to grow in holiness? Have you been deciding that you will do whatever it takes, however long it takes to, to gain victory over lust and greed and anger and a judgmental and self-righteous spirit? Are you asking God for his forgiveness when you fail and his strength to move forward in those things? Are you, are you not just trying to see how close you can get to the line without going over it, but like, does sin really bother you? Are you striving to bring unity and peace? Remember, blessed are the peacemakers. So we started with that in the first week. Like, is that you? Remember we talked about the fact that Jesus has called us to love our enemies? Or are you still, when somebody throws a punch at you, you're swinging back? Have you made any progress in those areas? Have you even tried to make progress in those areas? Has your relationship with the world been changed after hearing what Jesus said about being salt and light? Like, do you step into the world? Do you go into your workplace? Do you go into your school? Do you go into your family or your neighborhood and think, you know what, I'm salt and light, that's who I am. So I'm going to figure out how to be that here. Or does it look exactly the same as it looked 15 weeks ago? Forward, listen, I'm telling you this because I love you too much to see any more houses that look like they were built properly collapse. Because a week does not go by where Pastor Kirk or Pastor Greg or myself meet with somebody who looked like they were walking with Jesus. But there was no obedience. There was lots of hearing, but there was no doing. And their life has collapsed. <laughs> it hasn't just brought them down. There's been collateral damage everywhere. I'm telling you, I want you to build your house on a rock. When the foundation is faulty, it doesn't matter how nice the house looks. It doesn't matter how similar it looks to the other houses around it. I mean, we just saw that, right? Three weeks ago, Miami, Florida. We saw what happens when a foundation collapses. When Champlain Tower South had a faulty foundation. That whole build, building collapsed. And it wasn't just the lives of those inside. It was the lives of all those connected with all those people. And, and what's stunning, I don't know if you know this or have paid attention to this. There's actually buildings two and three doors down from Champlain Tower South. There's Champlain Tower North and Champlain Tower East, and they look almost identical. Same structure, same building plans, and the only difference was the foundation upon which they were sitting. And I'm telling you, church, the only way to build a sure foundation that withstands the storms of life is to choose a life of not only hearing the word of God, but doing it, but doing it. Let's pray. Father, we, we can't do this on our own. 
There is nothing that will change in this place today without the work of your Holy Spirit working in us and through us. And so, God, I'm just praying right now that even in this moment, your Spirit is working on and convicting some of us who have been hearing but not doing. Maybe no one else around us knows. They don't know about the sin that is eating and corroding underneath the surface. They, they, they just look and they see us attend and they see us laugh. They smile on Sunday. We go to life group. We're going through the motions, Father. We're hearing and we're hearing and we're hearing, but there is no doing. There is no life change. Deep, spirit adjusting, soul changing renewal that's taking place. And so, Father, I'm just praying right now that where that is true today, you would cause us to fall on our knees and confess, God, we're building on sand. And today we would choose to move forward with your help and your power that you freely give to us to begin to work on building on the rock of obedience, that we would not just hear Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount, but we would be those who would do them. God, I know there's some in this place right now, Father, who are building a whole different type of building. Their life is not centered on Jesus at all. They're living for themselves. And God, I know the reality that at some point we will stand before you in judgment. And if our life is not built on Jesus, we won't have anywhere to stand. And it will be catastrophic and all will be lost as we are cast into hell. So Father, I pray today if there have been those who have been walking with us through the Sermon on the Mount and they have been engaged with the teaching of Jesus, that today they would choose to put their trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you did the work that we could never do. And God, now as we, we take communion, would you bless us through this process of reminding us of your grace, even as we felt <laughs> the weight of your call, that we would be reminded of your help. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And I just thought, man, what a good Sunday morning to take this. Because listen, I know this is a weighty message. And, and there is always such a danger in these type of messages for our self-righteous, legalistic hearts to start to think about all we have to do to please God, to earn his favor. And, and we're going to eat this bread and drink this cup. If you are a follower of Jesus and you've placed your faith in Jesus, like Jesus is your rock, you've accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, let's take this together because because this is going to be such a good reminder for you today that we eat this bread and drink this cup. But here's what we confess. We confess that we have to take these because we couldn't do it on our own. But because of Jesus' great love for us, he did what we could never do. Maybe you've been sitting here today thinking, I'm, I'm such a failure at applying the words of Jesus in my life. You know who wasn't a failure at applying the words of Jesus? Jesus! <laughs> Jesus applied them, lived them fully and completely in a way that you and I never could. And so our righteousness is in him because he died on the cross and gave us his righteousness. He alone is sinless. He alone perfectly lived out the Sermon on the Mount in a way that we can't. And so when we take the bread and we take the cup, we're, we're, we're reminding ourselves that we partake in his holiness, in his forgiveness. And when we do this together, and I love that we get to do this together because when we partake this together, we're saying, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we all need this. None of us could do this on our own. And so, again, if that's your confession today, if you believe that Jesus died to give you a righteousness that you could not attain on your own, if you believe that he loved you so much that he hung on the cross for your forgiveness, then let's take this together and celebrate that reality that this makes all the difference. 
So let's take the bread. Just hold that for a second. Just, just take a moment. Don't look around you, maybe just close your eyes. And if God's been working on you today about an area where you've been hearing but there's not been a lot of doing, just, just come to him right now and ask him for forgiveness where you've fallen short. then as you confess that to him you would ask the Holy Spirit to give you the power you can't do this on your own he would give you the power to put these words into practice so you would do what you hear and then, then take this bread and look on it and be reminded that Jesus' body was broken for imperfect builders like us. Let's take it and eat. And then when we take the cup, and you can open up your cup there, we remind ourselves, all of us together, that Jesus' blood was poured out for our forgiveness to wipe the slate clean and to give us a fresh start. Today can be a new day in Christ for you. Let's take it and drink. Keith and the band are going to lead us in a song of worship together. We stand together as we close, declaring Christ as our cornerstone.
shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before 